thought I was about to give myself an ulcer reading through this page, I will be perfectly frank. Hello everyone, I hope that you are doing fabulously. My name is Emily and welcome to another episode of If the Slipper Fits, the series where I discuss and review just about any version of the Cinderella fairy tale that I can get my grubby little hands on. And I hope for many of you today's episode scratches that weirdly specific nostalgia itch like it does mine, because today we are talking about The Rough Face Girl. This is a children's book originally published in 1992 that tells the Cinderella story in the setting of an Algonquin Native American. American tribe. This is a book that I have not been able to get out of my head for literally years. I remember reading this multiple times in elementary school. We had the regular school library, obviously, but our teachers also had these little book bins in the classrooms where you could pick stuff out for like silent reading and whatnot. And I remember grabbing this book out of one of those little book bins and something about it just stayed with me for so freaking long. I can't remember if I read on the back originally that it was supposed to be Cinderella or if that was just something I picked up on by myself, but it always stuck out to me as a very different way to tell the story. And then, of course, as I got older, I learned about all of the various origin stories of Cinderella and Arne Thompson tale types and stuff like that, so this didn't really seem like that much of a commodity to me anymore, but it still remained a very memorable book to me. This book is written by Rafe Martin, who has written a bunch of other children's books, and most of them seem to be based on various folk tales and fairy tales from around the world. He also seems to be very interested in Zen Buddhism and has written a couple books regarding it for adults. The illustrations are by David Shannon, who is also a children's author in his own right. He wrote and illustrated A Bad Case of the Stripes and also these No David books, which I'm 99% sure I never read but definitely saw floating around my school library. As usual, I will start with a brief synopsis of the story just so that we're all on the same page. Then we're going to come back and discuss how this book specifically relates to the more familiar Cinderella story. And then I want to talk about the research that I did into the actual folk tale of the Rough Face Girl, because there's just a lot. <laughs> One quick thing I want to mention before we jump in. When I started this series and I was finding all of these different books at the library and whatnot, I was reminded that there is a section of the Dewey Decimal System that covers folklore, which includes fairy tales. So all of the books on Cinderella that I've been using have been from the non-fiction section, which I still can't not laugh at. I can understand it for adults, but apparently the same applies for the children's section. And let me tell you, very few kids are going to be looking through the non-fiction section of their own volition, so sticking this one over there just feels a little bit unfair to me. With that out of the way, let's get right to it. The story is set in a village on the edge of Lake Ontario. In a very large, beautiful wigwam, there lives an invisible being whom many women want to marry, and his sister. But the sister says that only the person who sees the invisible being can marry him. There's also a widower who lives with his three daughters. The youngest daughter is treated badly by the other two, and she has scarred skin and burnt hair from sitting so often by the fire. That's why she is referred to as the rough Face girl. The two older sisters decide that they want to try and marry the invisible being, so they ask their father for beautiful new clothes and go to meet the invisible being's sister. To try and prove if they've actually seen the invisible being, she asks them questions about the materials his equipment is made of, which they answer incorrectly. They still insist that they've seen the invisible being, so his sister lets them stay the night in the wigwam. When the invisible being comes home, they truly realize that they can't see him. The rough-faced girl also wants to marry the invisible being, claiming that she's seen him before. Like her sisters, she tries to ask her father for pretty clothes to wear, but he can only offer some broken shells and old moccasins. She takes them, and also makes herself a new set of clothes out of birch bark. 
The other villagers mock her as she goes, calling her ugly and telling her that she hasn't got a chance. But the invisible being's sister treats her kindly despite her appearance, and she asks the rough-faced girl the same questions to prove if she's seen him. The rough-faced girl answers correctly, saying his bow is made from the rainbow, and the runner of his sled is made from the Milky Way, or the Spirit Road of Stars. The invisible being's sister is thrilled and takes her back to the wigwam. When the invisible being gets home, he realizes that the rough-faced girl can see him and that she is destined to be his wife. She's then given beautiful new clothes and asked to bathe in the lake. When she does, all of her scars disappear and her hair becomes silky and full again. She and the invisible being are married and live very happily together. Like I said, I first want to talk about how this book specifically handles the tale. Off the bat, there's some small but very significant changes to the family dynamic. The protagonist's father is alive and she has biological sisters rather than stepsisters. There's also no stepmother figure at all, and thus the sisters themselves fully take on the antagonistic role. There also isn't any specific mention of how the father reacts to the treatment of the protagonist by her sisters, or even if he reacts at all. We do still have the familiar idea of the protagonist spending a lot of time by the fire, and that's how she gets her nickname. But instead of just being covered in ash, the rough-faced girl is literally scarred and burned from the fire. And jumping a little ahead here, but what Martin leaves out of the original folktale is one of the sisters actually uses coals from the fire to actively burn her. There's definitely a scale when it comes to the interpretations of Cinderella's mistreatment in different versions and adaptations, and so far on this series, this is the first time we've seen where she's dealt with direct acts of violence. There's no equivalent of a ball or a large social gathering or anything like that, but there is still a heavy focus on marriage, and specifically marrying someone who is deemed to be very important. And even if it's not a glass slipper, we do have this very specific condition as to who can marry the invisible being. You actually have to be able to see him, which apparently only one girl is able to do. And even though they're not necessarily relevant to the plot anymore, I do like how Martin takes the time to mention the moccasins. It's very subtle, he's not necessarily drawing attention to it or anything, but when you read it, you almost get this mental image of, hey, hey, get it? Like, the shoes? You get it? There also isn't necessarily a fairy godmother type in this story. When we have the rough-faced girl initially going to present herself to the invisible being, she basically does her whole makeover thing herself. She does get the shells and the moccasins from her father, but everything else she ends up making on her own. I think an argument could be made that the godmother role is served by the invisible being's sister. She is one of the few people in the village who actually treats the rough-faced girl with kindness kindness and doesn't judge her by her appearance. And after she knows that she's the one, she does give her the beautiful clothes and tells her to bathe in the lake where all of her scars disappear. But on the other hand, she is very protective of her brother and wants to make sure that he only ends up marrying the one who is actually worthy to marry him. So she almost ends up having her feet in two different camps. And in turn, the protagonist's ultimate reward at the end of the story isn't necessarily for remaining a good person despite what she's been through, but for seeing and appreciating the beauty of the world around her rather than only being concerned with beauty that's material or skin deep. Now, in the author's note, Martin explains that this story actually does have roots in Native American folklore. Quote, The Rough Face Girl, an Algonquin Indian Cinderella, is in its original form, actually part of a longer and more complex traditional story, end quote. However, most of what I could find as far as other records of this tale existing all seem to cover pretty much the same ground as Martin, very little more. And given that this is a children's book, there isn't exactly an appendix or a bibliography here that can tell me what sources Martin used. Nearly everything that I found pointed back to the same source, that being a book published in 1884 called The Algonquin Legends of New England by Charles G. Leland. Leland's book is in the public domain, so you can easily read it if you want to, 
But I will warn you, Leland didn't exactly seem too concerned about being objective when it came to the stories he was collecting. He does clearly see that parts of this story do relate to the French version of Cinderella by Charles Perrault, and I actually found that there's a really good reason for that. The Rough Faced Girl tale is most strongly associated with the Mi'kmaq people who populated Eastern Canada and parts of the Northeastern US. And by the 18th century, this group was exceptionally friendly with French Canadian settlers. They apparently traded, allied with each other for battle, and even intermarried quite frequently. And because they were so close, it's only natural that a lot of folklore would get exchanged between the two groups. So we actually do have a very clear line as to how this tale got to this specific group of people. The general consensus seems to be that the Mi'kmaq knowingly pulled elements from the French Cinderella, but also added their own elements as well to create the story of the rough face girl. Leland also compares the tale that he collected to the story of Cupid and Psyche, which, okay, yes, they both have the invisible boyfriend trope going on, but I would argue that most of the similarities between them are probably unintentional. And historically, there's a lot of evidence that the Cupid and Psyche story actually served as a precursor to Beauty and the Beast. Now, outside of Leland's book, most of the information I could easily find about this tale tended to come from these very old websites, <laughs> just very basic design, you know, very interestingly colored text on a similarly interesting colored background. And call me skeptical, I will answer to it gladly, but I did try to back up any information I found on these sites where I could. There's actually one website in particular, the address is kstrom.net, but the front page just says Native American Indian Resources, and it was last updated in 1997. This actually had a few dedicated pages talking about the Rough Face Girl tale, and I did end up learning a few things. However, for comparison's sake, the website also has a page talking about the European version of Cinderella, and the writer clearly had some kind of bone to pick because they just rip the entire fairy tale to absolute shreds. I thought I was about to give myself an ulcer reading through this page, I will be perfectly frank. Listen, there are plenty of other fairy tales that deserve criticism in a modern context, but if you badmouth Cinderella, you and I are gonna have issues. <laughs> and this could be completely off topic depending on what your theory is, but honestly, it made me laugh too much to not include it. <laughs> in one of his footnotes at the end of the story, Leland describes a similar yet different tale apparently told by the Passamaquoddy people. Leland doesn't necessarily regard it this way in his book, but Kaystrom says that it could be interpreted as a kind of sequel to the Mi'kmaq tale. If you do read it that way, basically the invisible being and the rough face girl, I guess now former rough face girl, um, have a son and he loses his sight for a while, but he gains it back, and for whatever reason, his mom doesn't necessarily believe that he can see again. So she gives some things to the invisible being, knowing that her son wouldn't be able to describe them if he couldn't actually see them. And the first two things are straight from the original, the rainbow and the spirit road. And then his mother asks, uh, and what's, what's on your dad's sled? And the son says, it's a beaver. <laughs> And that's how she knows that he can see again. <laughs> oh god. It's hundreds of years old, and yet it has the same energy of like one of those jokes that you tell your friends in middle school. You know, like the really long ones that you have to set up and they're ultimately like to make you seem smarter than everybody else in the room. And they're also most of the time kind of mean. <laughs> but this isn't mean, it's just Silly. <laughs> Beavers are definitely one of those animals where if you tried to describe it to somebody who didn't know what a beaver was, they would think you're nuts. <laughs> and that's what makes them amazing. <laughs> oh God, where even was I? Another website's recounting of the tale actually gives it a little bit of a different flavor as far as the writing goes. This one actually was last updated in 2016 and it ends, and so they were married. And from then on, Wujias had a new name, the lovely one. Like her husband, she too had kept herself hidden, waiting for the right person to find her. 
and now that she had that person's love, she was hidden no more. I have kind of mixed feelings about this read of it. On the one hand, it's definitely implied that the rough-faced girl maybe didn't have the highest reputation in the village because of her appearance, and the invisible being and his sister were the only people able to see past that much like she did for him. And now that she's become his wife, the others can finally understand who she is on the inside. But on the other hand, this wording has a pretty explicit, the love of the right person can cure you kind of energy. And I definitely don't feel good about it. If we weren't dealing with a physical deformity, I think I could let it slide because there's absolutely nothing wrong with reading Cinderella as wanting her love to save her from a bad situation. But when you add that into the mix, I don't know, something just doesn't sit right with me. But again, this is just one specific retelling of a folktale that I happen to find, so I'm definitely just splitting hairs at this point. Oh, and one last little thing that I forgot to mention from Leland's collection is we again have this mention of one of the sisters having these moments of kindness with the protagonist. I honestly thought that this trope was a much more modern idea, but apparently not. So at the end of the day, this is a beautiful little book and a great way to introduce kids to the inherent complexity of fairy tales. There's never just one version of any story. We have been retelling and remixing these things for years and they have traveled and grown and shrunk and evolved into a million different things. And that is exactly why I find them fascinating. And I love that the deeper we look, it keeps getting harder and harder to find a time and a place where a Cinderella story was not relevant. Thank you so much for joining me and bearing with me for this episode. It honestly felt like a little bit of a mess. Hopefully it doesn't come off that way. You can show your support for this video by giving it a like, and if you're interested in seeing more episodes when they come out, then feel free to subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you have a suggestion for a Cinderella thing that I should cover in the future, definitely leave me a comment and I will be sure it gets added to the list. But for now, I think I'm about to turn into a pumpkin, so I will see you next time. Bye!